All right, welcome everybody. Mike, it's one o'clock on Tuesday. It's time for the live show. My favorite part of the week, George. <laughs> All right, so I'm George Bider, Vice President of Sales, and with me is Mike Huber, our Director of Technical Services. And uh, Mike, I think you kind of overdid yourself. We got a lot of demos here today. Yeah, we got a lot of fun stuff. You know, we know that there are some people that have heard horror stories about polymeric sand. We're here to show you what some of those horror stories are and how to avoid them. Yeah, so Mike's done an amazing job of building out different demos to really explain where some of those pitfalls are. But before we get into those, just Mike, remind us how to use Demio. Yeah, real quick, if you go to where that big blue arrow is pointing, that'll take you full screen, give you the best viewing experience for our show today. And we love questions. It helps keep us on our toes, keeps it interactive. So if you have any questions, go where that circle is flashing. Open up the chat window, type your questions in there. We'll either answer you live or make sure we get back to you after the show. Yeah, those are super important to us. And like Mike said, if we can't get to all of them live, we've got a team here that's going through those. And we'll make sure your local rep follows up and answers any questions that you may have. So uh, the other thing we want to do is just thank you for your business over the years. And thank you for par uh, taking, partaking time and listening to us during these shows. So what do we have for prizes, we Mike? We give away a lot of cool stuff each year, right? This year's no exception. We've got the Yeti backflip cooler, five Yeti tumblers, two Amazon gift cards, and a couple of boxes of insomnia cookies. A lot of good loot, a lot of good loot. So, and then let's hit the winners for, I think we hit the week five winners, which yeah, is pretty important. Yeah, we're halfway through, right? Yep. So Dave Willenbrook from Northern Nurseries up in New Jersey, the local guy who was the big winner last week of that backflip cooler. Yeah, that's a nice one to get. And then we got the uh, Yeti tumblers or the Rambler tumblers. We got Gary from Action up in Minnesota. We got Rebellio from uh, Ontario which is pretty cool going all the way through North America John out of Connecticut with ONG Patrick in Ohio and Kevin out in New York so a lot of good winners yeah, for that people are one. winning all over the place right absolutely <laughs> Good. And then we got the Amazon gift cards going to Kelly in West Virginia and Andy out in Kansas. And Mike, who got the insomnia cookies? Uh, looks like Stephanie, Stephanie and Mario are the lucky winners of the cookies. They're probably enjoying munching on cookies right now yeah. as we speak. Hopefully they warmed them up. <laughs> so awesome. So we got a lot of great prizes. Those are just our way of saying, hey, thanks for giving us the business over the years and thanks for participating in some of these shows. So uh, we'll get into that. But Mike, let's talk about polymeric sand. Well, polymeric sand is a pretty cool invention, right? At yeah. least I think so. Hey, it's a good way to make a living. It's worked well for us, and it's a great way to help interlock those pavers. So I think it's got a history with that. Right. So when people first came up with segmental pavers, yep. they needed something in between the joints. That provides the interlock, that friction hold that prevents rotational movement. It prevents the pavers from shifting in place. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you put regular sand in the joints, it's prone to washing out. You could right. have weeds growing up through it or burrowing insects. Yeah, so a couple of decades ago, the industry came out with polymeric sand, and it really gave us those three key benefits to help eliminate weeds, help eliminate insects infiltrating into your joint sand, and help eliminating any of the erosion and washout that you're talking about. Right, I think it really helped improve the popularity of concrete paving stones because originally, who wanted a patio where they had to go out and pull weeds every right. year, right? Yeah, kind of nasty, so these really helped improve the overall hardscaping industry. Right, and while those benefits are fantastic, there are a few misconceptions exceptions about polymeric sands. A lot of people think that polymeric sands are hard top to bottom and the joint should be like a chunk of concrete. Right. They, we hear that a lot. It's, uh, they think it's going to behave and perform like mortar, but it's not. It has a little unique characteristic to it. Right. Polymeric sands all form a crust, and that crust could be an inch thick. It could be a quarter inch thick. It might even be all the way through in rare cases, but that crust is designed to be a durable, resilient, yet flexible top to that sand, supported by densely packed material underneath, performs yep. those intended functions of interlock, preventing erosion, weeds, burrowing insects. Right. That's the whole idea. Yeah, and I think the key word you talk about is flexibility. You know, a whole paving stone application's got a, a flexible pavement system. Polymeric sands, when performed properly, retain that flexibility and provide some self-healing characteristics, but you've got some differences in different performances here. So what do we have? Right, well, what you might find if you go out to a project is something like this, where you've got, well, what appears to be a pretty thin little crust. So that thin little crust might have come from a couple of installation errors. Yeah. It could have come from improper watering. So if you didn't add enough water when yep. you initially activated your polymeric sand, it might have only gotten down a little bit into that joint and yeah. activated the top layer. 
which we see a lot of is that, that thin crust that we always refer to it, and that's what you're saying is due to probably inadequate watering a lot of times. Or improper watering, okay. right? If they're using our new Gator Max G2, which only requires one watering, and they do that old three-step process right. or missed it once and walk away, they're going to have a problem. G2 Gator Max self-protects from rain so quickly, it's going to repel subsequent waterings. You really need to activate that material nice and deep yeah. in that first go-round. So that's where you get into that really thin crust. So that's one of the horrors that we see out there is that thin crust because of improper or not enough watering. Right. If you have a very thin crust, odds are it's not going to have the structural integrity to perform for the yep. long term. It's not going to last 15 years as we expect our polymeric sands to right. do. And you'll have a premature failure. Awesome. What we want to see is something more like this. So we're going to peel this apart here. And you can yeah, see that much deeper. there's still there. some wet material in there, but basically Three quarters of an inch of solid setup sand, you know, nice thick joint there, still drying out a little bit on the bottom, but a very, very strong, durable, resilient joint. Right. So that looks great. And we're going to get to some of that moisture issue talking about that wet sand. But the thing that's worth noting there, Mike, is it's not hard at the bottom. It's hard at the top, but not hard at the bottom. And that's that crust you're talking about. Right. So we have a nice, firm, durable, resilient crust. Yep. And we've got some material that's setting up underneath. It's yep. still a little bit spongy, right. it's cohesive, it's not going anywhere, it's supporting that crust. And over time, if it dries out, it will harden. Okay. If it stays wet, it may stay soft and flexible, a little bit gummy, and that's not a problem. Yeah, right. So that's the way we want the sands to look. It'll, f it'll f form that nice thick crust. That could be, you're saying, quarter inch down to maybe even in some cases the full depth of that joint, right? Right. I've seen sand that's set up two and three eighths of an inch deep. So yeah. it can happen if you have a very dry environment. Yeah, absolutely. So, so water is a big issue here, and you've got some cool little demo thing here. What do we have with this thing, Mike? Well, we talked about environment. Environment, right? Yep. We activate polymeric sands with water, and as they dry out, they harden up. Right. So that's great, unless they don't dry up. Right. So if you've got an environment, whether it's clay soils, stone dust or screenings underneath your project, yeah. a concrete overlay with no way for water to escape, you may activate your polymeric sand joints, yep. and they may never dry out. Right. So what we've simulated here is that environment where things never dry out, right? We okay. activated this channel the same time we activated those two channels we just showed really? you. Really? Wow. and stuck it in a baggie with some water okay. in it, so very, very wet. And you can see... Ooh, <laughs> not good. Not great. It's soaking wet, right? It yep. hasn't dried out. It's still a little gummy. It's still gummy. Yep. It's still cohesive. It's still trying to bond together. Okay. But until it dries out, it can't actually cure. It can't yeah. harden up. So okay. we've got loose material in here. So it, you can see that it's still... Got yeah, that gumminess to yeah, it, right? right? It's still almost intact. We've got chunks here, and they're coming apart. We're going to show you a little bit about what happens if this doesn't dry out, what happens if it freezes before yeah. it dries out. We're going to go through that. a couple different scenarios here for you and show you how that works. And I believe we have a question yeah. coming in. Let's get it. Topher, what's the question? All right, a couple questions here. Ben asked, should full shaded areas cause moss, mold, or mildew? They I certainly can. Yeah. You know, moss mold and mildew can happen anywhere that you have a damp, humid environment. Right. Things don't dry out, moss mold and mildew will grow, whether it's on a polymeric sand joint, a paver, the side of your house, the you know, north side of a tree. Yeah. Those things happen. And that's not a polymeric sand issue. Right. Contrary to popular belief, <laughs> we don't put mold spores or ant colonies into our sand, right? right? If anything like that happens, it's coming from the environment. So yeah couple simple, easy ways to clean that, but maintenance is what's required in that application. Yeah. It's also a good indicator, too, Mike. We're out on a lot of projects where we see that algae, that moss, mold, mildew kind of thing. Good indicator you've got some moisture issues there, which could lead to the performance of sand, which is what you just showed here. Correct. Topher, we got another question. Let's fire it off. Gary asks, can you fill a joint halfway up with normal joint sand and then finish off with a polymeric sand? Well, you can, but it's not a good idea. <laughs> Never a good idea. <laughs> so we have a specific gradation, a C144 sand. It's all kiln dried when we manufacture it. It's all mixed with the binders. So even though you're getting a crust, which yeah. may only be an inch thick, you don't want to try to fill up the bottom of that joint with something else. Right. Typically, that material may be a little bit wet. It may be damp. It might not be the right gradation. And you're not going to get a solid, firm foundation for your polymeric sand. Right. Beyond that, 
I've never seen anyone that could evenly fill up halfway up a paver joint yeah. across 500 square feet. Right. So you get just a big inconsistent mix of sand in the joint. So we do not recommend that. We'll show you, Mike. I think you've got some molecular <laughs> ions coming up here that'll help uh, articulate that for Gary a bit more. So. All right, good. So we talked about some moisture issues. We talked about that. One of the things I want to get to, Mike, is um, you, you, what you're showing here is that worming effect that we've, we've seen before. What's that all about? Well, if you only activate a very thin crust, or even if you activate it properly and you have a very wet environment, yeah. you can end up with this kind of worming, bubbling, or rippling, wrinkling effect. R right. What happens is you end up with a very thin skin on your polymeric sand. Yeah. And that thin skin is subject to damage from hydrostatic pressure, right? If you have no drainage, it's a wet environment, you have a thin skin, that water pressure actually causes that wrinkling or bubbling to okay. occur. Very bad looking. That's definitely one of the horror stories that we see out there. So, Mike, two questions for you. One, how do you avoid it? And two, what do you do when you do see that worming? Well, the way you avoid it is by installing your sand and your project correctly, right? Make sure that you do have drainage. Okay. ICPI recommends that you consider incorporating drainage into any hardscape project, which is key. Yeah. You want to make sure that water can drain out the bottom of your project. You want to make sure that you have proper surface pitch. You want to make sure that your polymeric sand is compacted, yep. the joint height is set properly, and it's watered properly. Absolutely. All those factors give you the best chance to avoid this thin skin and worming effect. Right. As far as what to do if it happens, I'd say cross your fingers and wait. Yeah. Um, typically, as a polymeric sand joint dries out and cycles from wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, yeah. that wrinkling will start to even out and disappear. Right. And that's what I, I knew you were going to say, that waiting thing. It's, uh, it's frustrating. It's unsightly. But we often do see that if you do wait, over time, you can see that dissipate as that sand underneath it gets activated and, and maybe helps dissipate that worming effect. So and waiting things can dry out, right? Away. If it's yeah. happening in the spring with a lot of rain, it should dissipate and, and disappear as you get into summer, Absolutely. for example. Great. And I think we have a question here. Do I have to install polymeric sand in lifts in order to see correct depth penetration? No, you do not. So you do not need to install polymeric sand in lifts. You know, if you have something that happens to be like a yeah. six inch deep um, joint in natural stone, you're still only going to get a crust on that, right. right? G2 Gator Max polymeric sands are designed to accept a lot of water. They have a surfactant. It's a chemical designed to help pull that water down deep into the joint. So right. if you move to the G2 products from Alliance, you're going to have the best chance of getting a deep water penetration and a thicker crust. Right. We do recommend, though, as a point of clarification, the compaction piece, which we're going to get to. So we'll, we'll add to that when we talk about compaction and show you how that has an impact, but a little different than the lifts that you're familiar with in terms of base material. Topher, I think we got one more question. If you have old polymeric sand that is eroding on top, can you simply top off the top of the joint with new product, or do you need to completely clean out the joint and reapply all new sand. You need to completely yeah. clean out that joint. And it can be tough to completely clean out a joint and not disturb the bedding sand. So, you know, an inch and a half of clean out on a typical two and three eighths inch paver yep. is what we're looking for. Yeah, it's not easy. It's messy, but that's the right way to do it. And that's the best going to give you the best performance right. on it. So, so we talked a lot about how moisture can be a problem right. with polymeric sands yep. and paver projects in general, right? Yep, absolutely. I think we should probably show everyone a little bit about the material, Things right? Things that cause those moisture problems, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there's an evil word in the industry, stone dust, Mike. Why is it so evil? Well, stone dust is a waste product, right? When uh, companies and quarries crush stone to give you the aggregate as a foundation material, they end up with a lot of fine dust and yeah. stuff that falls out the bottom of their screening machines. And they want something to do, you know, they want to get rid of that material. Right. So they decided, hey, let's promote it and sell it to hardscapers to use as a setting bed material. Yep. And it's a really bad setting bed material. And guys love it because it's cheap on the front end, but it's not so cheap on the back end because it has a lot of problems. Right. It's not structurally stable, so you're going to eventually see that break down and potentially yeah. cause movement occurring in your paver system. It has so much fine material, tiny, tiny little particles, silt, right. silt materials that will block water flow and trap water molecules within that stone dust layer. So not yeah. only does it block water from flowing through, but it actually maintains like a wet sponge effect. Yeah, it's like underneath a paste your project. under there that you know, nothing passes through and it holds water. What we want to see underneath a paving stone project is C33 concrete sand. Yeah. So it's a coarse graded angular sand. 
allows great structural stability for your project and great water flow through. Right. And it's important to note, Mike, as smart as you are, I know there's a lot of other paver manufacturers that preach this no stone dust thing. We believe it, and uh, so does ICPI. So it's not just George and Mike telling you to do that and not use stone dust, but all the paving stone manufacturers are standing behind the no stone dust mantra. And ICPI. Yeah. I mean, I, I think most... Uh, people that have done a lot of work with pavers, you know, maybe they're doing it because it's convenient, but they yeah. do understand that it doesn't drain well. Good stuff. If you don't understand that, we're going to do a little demonstration for you right here. So All right. we've got 16 ounces of water we're going to put in this watering can, and we're going to pour it into our material here. So we'll pour it into our sand first. Yeah, you can see that draining right back into what would be your native soil. Right, so we've got our water coming right through that concrete sand. Yep. Now Just we'll do another we 16 it. ounces of water. All right, and then we've got that evil stone dust and here. And we'll pour it on our stone dust layer here. Oh, lost a little bit, but... So you can see we have nothing coming through our stone dust layer, right? The sand is completely drained from that overhead shot, yeah. and the stone dust looks like a bath, a mucky bath. Yeah, I, I, I always notice, and, and I look at it, and it lo almost looks like cement, and it's just sitting there, no drainage, everything's clogged well, up. Well, in it's a, a lot of cases, it almost is like cement, right? Yeah. It's lime Screenings. particles, right? Screenings, and that lime actually can almost form a cement-like substance. Right. Yeah. Almost calcified material. Yeah. So that moisture sitting under your pavers leads to a lot of problems. So let's get this out of here, and we'll talk about another problem. That moisture acts like a lubricant. So right. So that moisture can cause efflorescence in the pavers. It can cause wet sand joints, but it also starts to lubricate all of the particles yep. in your base material. So with lubrication all of those base material particles can start to settle and move, and you may end up with some shifting of your project. Right, and that movement is awful. There's a few other things that are going to um, um, account for that movement of, of paving stones or natural stone, and that's edge restraint. We've got a couple of edge restraint op options out there for you, Mike. Talk about those. Right, so we've got plastic edge restraint, rigid and flex, low profile for natural stone. Yep. They work great. You extend your base hopefully 6 inches or 12 inches past your project, yep. depending on pedestrian or vehicular, and you put your edge restraint down. We've got a great new concrete edging product called Extreme Edge. That prevents all that lateral movement and migration. Right, pretty awesome if products. If we see movement in a paving stone system, it may be a little bit too much movement for a polymeric sand to handle, right? Right, yeah. So once you get movement, you got problems. There's a couple things that we talked about that can create movement. One, moisture, that lubricant, no edge restraint. But once you get movement, you got problems. Right, like. and it could even come from improper installation from the beginning, right? Yeah. You need to make sure your paving stones and your natural stone are stable before you install polymeric sand. Now, right. polymeric sand is meant to be a joint filling material, right? It's not meant to glue your project together. Right, not to be, it's flexible, but it's not mortar. Right, so we've got a little natural stone install here. If you can cut to that GoPro. So we've got a nice sand joint, right? It's tough, it's durable, it's resilient. But if our stones start to move, we're going to have a problem. So you can see the stone's yep. moving a little bit, right? Lifting up. As we get more and more, it starts uh, to crack. I see it. There's a problem with your sand. Your sand's cracking, Mike. Right, so our sand has started to crack. Now we've got these little cracks developing through here. I'll kind of tilt it up so you can see it a little better. So you can see those cracks coming in here. Yeah. And over time, that movement is just too much for the polymeric sand to handle, even though it's got some degree of flexibility, right? Right. As that sand joint cracks, even more water gets in, and that destructive cycle just continues. Right. So that's another one of the horror stories we get with polymeric sand. It's really a system failure. When you start seeing excessive movement like this, Mike was showing you movements. We've seen that on driveways frequently, and even on patios that maybe the base material is improper. Maybe it's that horrible dreaded stone dust. Maybe it's just not compacted properly, so you get di uh, differential settlement down the road, and you get that excessive movement. That leads to problems that Mike's just showing you here. And we can see that crust again, right? So that's that thick, durable, resilient crust supported by compacted base material underneath. And I think we have a question here. A couple questions. Paul, uh, Matt is asking, polysand, I'm assuming he's asking, can polysand in pavers be, can, can polysand be used in pavers over a concrete base? Certainly. Our yeah. Gator Max was one of the first polymeric sands to be 
designed specifically for that concrete overlay application. Right, and that overlay has a lot of challenges, and I think if we can get Ryan to pull up a graphic here, this is one I really love, Mike, because it talks about the drainage. This whole uh, time we've been talking, we've been talking a lot about water and the problems with water. An overlay has significant issues with drainage if not done properly. Right, it's a great structural foundation, but water can't go through concrete. So if you see there, We've got a quarter for scale, and that little drill hole is what we typically see <laughs> yeah. a contractor do, if they do anything at all. Right, right. That's not appropriate for drainage. What we need to see is that big two-inch core drilled hole filled with pea gravel or clean stone, put a piece of filter fabric on top, yeah. and that concrete slab needs to look like a piece of Swiss cheese. It's not just two holes in a 3,000 square foot driveway. Right, so you can use poly sand on an overlay. Our Gator Max product is the first one to come out specifically designed for overlay, but make sure you get that drainage right on the overlay so it's not just a bathtub under the pavers. Right, and whatever you do for your edge restraint, if you're doing a concrete edge, make sure you're not completely blocking off the pathway for water to flow off of that slab underneath the concrete pavers. Right. Good stuff. So the, we talked about materials and some movement and stuff. Well, let's talk about some of the installation things, the first being that compaction. Right. Compaction is vital. If yep. you do not compact your polymeric sand, you're actually missing 30 to 50 percent of the sand yep. that should be in your joint. If you're missing 30 to 50 percent of the sand that should be in your joint, well, how strong can it actually be, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we see a lot of that. It's not something that just we talk about. It's something that ICPI talks about. And Mike, you've got a, a drawing here that you want to show to help articulate that. Right. So we've got our little cross-section drawing here. We've got pavers, right? Yep. Paver, 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 which leaves some joint space in between our pavers here. Okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to sweep polymeric sand into our joints, right? right. Yep. So I'm going to put some polymeric sand particles in here. Okay. So this is polymeric sand that you're showing in here. And these are the different sand particles. And next you're going to show just how they're kind of connected through the, the polymeric process. Right. So we've got our, you know, points where they touch, right? Yep. So we have a few points where they touch, bonded together, not all that strong, right? The yep. particles are far apart. They only touch in a single point. Sure. They're not going to be all that strong. Right. Okay. If we actually come in and we compact, we're going to have twice as many particles, right? Yep. That's what we're talking about. If you're not compacting, you risk not having enough sand in that joint as much as 30 to 50 percent less sand in that joint, which leads to problems. So now you can see we have less void space. We have more points of contact. So we're going to have much greater structural strength. Yep. And we're going to have much greater water resistance. You know, if you consolidate, if you compact that sand, you have way more polymeric sand in the joints. Yeah. The polymers, the glue that binds it all together, has more points of contact between those particles. So you end up with a joint that is much stronger right. and much more water resistant. Yeah, so cool drawing. We got another question. While the Topher reads off the question, we'll set up this demo to help articulate what you're showing there in a 3D model. So Topher, what's the question? Patrick is asking, which is better for joint stability, properly installed poly sand or properly installed sand joint sealer? I'm assuming he means sand stabilizer. Yeah, it sounds like it's a, st a joint stabilizer sealer, Mike. Right. Comment on that. So if you did a uh, joint stabilizer sealer versus polymeric sand, yep. and you used a C30, uh, I mean a uh, ASTM C144 sand, yep. theoretically, you'd still have great interlock with both options, right? right? Interlock preventing the rotational movement of those pavers and allowing it to perform for the long term, right? right? As far as the weeds go, the erosion, the burrowing insects, Joint sand stabilization works as long as that sealer's working. Right. And that lifespan is probably in the neighborhood of three years, four years, maybe five years. Right. But it's certainly not the 15 years that we warranty Gator, Max poly uh, Gator polymeric sands for. Yeah, so the first couple of years you'll get pretty much the same benefits, but over the long haul you're going to have much better longevity with the polymeric sand in that option. And I think we have one more question here, Topher. Andy's asking, referring to that last infographic you threw up there, what should the spacing be on those two-inch drain holes in a concrete overlay? Yeah. 
Well, the general idea is to put them about every five feet in a grid pattern yeah. and then put more at any low area where water may gather. So if you're doing something that's got um, curbing, you know, you need to put a whole row of them up against the curb there yeah. to allow water to go through. If you've got catch basins built into your project, make sure you can allow surface water to get to your catch basins, but you also allow subsurface water to drain through that concrete slab or get into your catch basins. Yeah. The it's other key point is that drain holes through concrete are great. Two-inch core drilled holes are fantastic, but if they simply go to clay soil, it's not going to matter. Right, yeah, just going down through. The general rule of thumb, I was like, whatever you think is enough, Probably double is what you really need on those core drill holes. And if you're doing a concrete slab in really poor clay soils that don't drain well, you may need to incorporate some kind of drainage yeah. system that captures Actual the water from out. all those core drilled holes and pipes it off to another location. Yeah. So, Mike, this is what I'm talking about. I think you've overdone it here. What, what are we looking at? All right. So, in here, in this tub, we have unconsolidated, uncompacted polymeric sand, right? Let's yep. think of all these little white balls as our polymeric sand particles, yep. sand particles, and in here you've got all these little pipe cleaners that are acting as the bond, yeah. the polymers gluing those particles together. Absolutely. Now you'll see there's a lot of void space in here, right? So yep. that means that the particles are not densely packed, they're not all touching very well, you can have plenty of water flow through this. Right. That could lead to problems with your joint staying wet. Okay, and then compare it to what we have in this container. Right, so here we have twice as many sand particles, twice as many of these little balls, all densely packed, yep. much less void space, more contact between the particles. That polymer can really glue these things together much more strongly. Right, and I think I know what's going to happen here. That definitely looks stronger if we put these weights on it, but I think we're going to have to do a little show and tell to right. prove it out. So, so what happens if we simulate settlement over time with this unconsolidated polymer. Right, sand. so o over time, if we add a little bit of weight on this thing, uh, it just, just compacted, right? Kills it, yep. So that dropped quite a bit. That's dramatically showing yeah. you how unconsolidated polymeric sand will not only settle over time, but it's much weaker right. and allows much more water through it. Yeah. I'm going to do the same thing on these consolidated sand particles, right? So he put one weight on there and it fell. I'm going to put, I don't know what, three? Yeah. Go three weights. And no movement. Holds it up just fine, yeah. right? So having that sand densely packed in the joints ensures that you'll have great long-term performance from that polymeric sand joint. Yeah. Stronger, more water resistant, able to perform its intended function for a long period of time. Right. And I think the cool thing that you showed here is it looked like on the surface that joint was full all the way, which we see all the time in the field. That's the other horror story that we see. Hey, it looked full. It was all set. So we went to the water activation stage. But down the road is where you get that weakening of the joint. Right. Even if it looks like it's all the way full, you don't know if you have void space, air pockets where that sand hasn't migrated downwards. And even if you did fill it up from top to bottom, it's still loose and fluffy. Right. So the key to avoiding that pitfall or that horror story is kind of going back to what Gary asked about the uh, installing in lifts. You do want to compact. So you're going to sweep the sand in. And we show this in our original G2 sand installation. You sweep the sand in. You compact it. That will settle here and then you, you will finish it off with more sand and compaction. And everything needs to be compacted. Just right. because it's a piece of natural stone, it's a large paver slab, it, it's a large wet cast paver right. slab, you still need to compact and consolidate. So whether it's, you know, rubber mallet, uh, two by four at yeah. the very least, or a roller compactor, which would be the best option for those large slabs, make sure it is consolidated. Right. Good. I think we got another question here, Topher. Regarding OSHA compliance, David is asking, is there a health risk in handling polymeric sand? All right. All Mike. right. Well, that OSHA topic just keeps coming up over and over again, yeah. right? Yeah, so, silica George, sands. what is it that OSHA doesn't want I, us to breathe? I th I'm going to give you the acronym for it, Mike. It's the RCS. Right, I'll let so you say it. Respirable crystalline silica yeah. is what we don't want to breathe. Those are those tiny particles of silica that become airborne and lodge in your lungs and never leave. Right. We don't want to breathe it. You don't want to breathe it. Your next door neighbors don't want to see it. So we've gone above and beyond with this with polymeric sands. Right. When OSHA was enacting those regulations, we went out and we tested all of our polymeric sands. We didn't just
just test the raw material in the right. bag, right? Yep. We actually installed thousands and thousands of square feet with guys that had specialized vacuum um, equipment that actually sampled the air continuously as they were working over an eight-hour day. Right. And we proved that all of the Alliance polymeric sands are well below those permissible exposure limits for OSHA. Yeah, so not only is it safe to handle, it's safe to actually use on the job site, which I'm sure you care more about is actually application of it. Yep. So good stuff. So we talked a lot about the materials, Mike. We're going to go and talk about the joint height here. So the joint height is also pretty important, which is another one of the horror stories we've talked right. about. Right. We see problems all the time where that joint is flush with the surface, right? Yeah. We want to make sure it's recessed. It's at least an eighth of an inch below the sharp edge or chamfer of the paver. If you have that joint too high, it causes several problems. The first problem is that you can't actually activate it properly. Your water just runs off the surface. Right. Second problem is that over time, that polymeric sand expands when it's wet and contracts when it's dry. Yeah. That's how polymeric sands work. That's a normal cycle, right? Yeah. So they'll swell a little bit is what you're saying. When they're wet, they'll swell a little bit. When they dry out, they contract and okay. harden back up, right? Right. Natural cycling process. Unfortunately, if you install it flush with the surface, it's vulnerable to damage because it's flush with the surface. Right. And it's really vulnerable to damage if it expands above the surface. Right. And that's why I always talk about the importance of this. It's not, it's, it's aesthetics in my opinion, but it's really performance is really impacted by the improper joint height. Right. It's really a huge structural issue. Yeah. If we have that joint way too high, it's just going to be prone to damage. Concrete paving stones are tough. They're yeah. 9, 10,000 PSI concrete. They're designed to take that load, to take abrasion from foot traffic, from vehicle right. tires. Polymeric sand is pretty durable, tough stuff, but it's not as tough as a concrete paver. No, definitely not designed to be your wearing course. Let your pavers, let your natural stone do that, but let your polymeric sand be uh, recessed at least an eighth of an inch below the chamfer. Mike, this is my favorite demo that you put together. <laughs> All right, let's get on that GoPro shot, the real close up here. So you can see here. This is a paver that has a chamfer, right? There is the chamfer, that kind of angled edge to the paver. And we want our polymeric sand to be an eighth of an inch below the chamfer. Right. Eighth of an inch below the edge of natural stone. Eighth of an inch below the rounded edge of a paver. So if you've got something that's more of a cobblestone looking paver, right. you might be a three eighths of an inch or a half inch down below the surface to have the right joint height. Yeah. And there's a reason that's really important. We talked about that wearing course and getting extra wear and tear on the polymeric sand. <laughs> right. So here you have the joint that's installed flush with the surface, right? Yeah. And no matter how many times we teach eighth of an inch below the surface, there's always that contractor that says, well, the homeowner wanted me to install it that way, right? right? I love that comment because the homeowner's not calling the shots. The homeowner's not backing up your warranty. It's Alliance that's giving you the 15-year warranty. So if you want a great way to avoid the warranty, then you can listen to the homeowner. If you want to uphold the warranty, then listen to Mike and install the joints the right way, which is an eighth of an inch below the chamfer. And trust me, if it was possible to install the sand flush, and use a lot more polymeric sand, <laughs> George here would be recommending it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so what happens when a vehicle drives across this surface? We've got our little Alliance Gator Mobile here. Yeah. And we're going to drive across the surface. So you see the tires are going to hit the polymeric sand that's installed flush, right? Right. That means that that sand could get pulled out of the joint, torn, yeah. damaged. Twisted, if there's any kind of radius turning in the driveway, like turning. That. Exactly. As we keep driving, though, you'll see that the car drives right over that joint that has yeah. the polymeric sand installed at the proper height. Right. So I always like, you know, I see these manufacturer's catalogs. They're showing the beautiful pavers that they're offering these days. And when you see the difference in a properly installed joint, it looks so much better. And you really see the, the contours of the paving stones much better than that sand spilled all over the tops and flush mounted. Not, not the way to do Plus it. Plus it makes it much easier to activate properly, get the right amount of water into that joint quickly, yeah. and it's going to last a lot longer. Absolutely. Let's get another question here, Topher. All right, Joshua asks, should pavers be compacted prior to sweeping in poly sand or after sweeping in the poly sand? All right. Well, that kind of depends on your installation method, right? Yeah. If you have a traditional install, crushed stone sand setting bed, typical guidance is to compact your pavers, do that final compaction, and then install your polymeric sand. Right. We want that sand to migrate up into the bottom of the paver and help provide interlock from the setting bed. Right. If you happen to be doing a gator base install, well, you're which just... Which you should be. Which you <laughs> should be. <laughs> you're installing that polymeric sand and doing your compaction all in one shot. Right. Good. 
Topher, one more question here. Um, Mark is asking, are folks compacting the sand in the joint or compacting the pavers, like with a plate compactor? Compacting the pavers would promote the settling of the sand in the joint, but not actually compact the sand. I think this comes into discussion between compaction and consolidation. Well, we could certainly address that in greater detail, but by vibrating those pavers, by compacting those pavers, you're providing that consolidation to the sand joint itself. All those vibrations right. cause that sand to settle and densely pack. Yeah, which is pretty important. So once you get the joint height right, you've done the compaction that we talked about. That final watering stage is the other horror, the other pitfall that we see as they, uh, they finish the project and do the watering. So what's our take on the whole watering? Well, it's tough because that watering process has changed quite a bit through the years, yeah. right? When polymeric sands were first launched, it was missed once and walk away from it, right? right. Don't water it too much. You'll wash the polymers out of it. Yeah, I remember Things have that changed myth. quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> then we went to three-step watering, right? Water it once lightly, follow it up with two more successive waterings, a little bit heavier each time. Don't let it dry out in between. Right. Polymeric sands kept getting better. We've improved our products. G2 polymeric sands from Alliance only require one watering, and they should only get one watering. Right, and it's pretty key. That's really where the industry is going, and certainly Alliance is, is really moving much more of the, the G2 because of all the performance benefits of it. So for the sake of today's discussion, we're going to talk really about G2 and the proper watering with G2. So where do we stand with that? 30 seconds for 30 square feet is a good rule of thumb. That's a great way to start, a great uh, rule of thumb, but it doesn't really answer every need. So 30 for 30 is great. That's your typical paver where you're getting 50, 60, 70 square feet out of a bag of polymeric sand. If you're doing something where you only get 15 or 20 square feet out of a bag of polymeric sand, well, you're going to need more water. Right. So it might be... 45 seconds for 30 square feet or a minute for 30 square feet. Yeah, and I think like Mike's saying, the general rule of thumb is once you start seeing that water start getting repelled by the sand and pooling up, that's your time to back off. You got enough water on there or if that's all the water that's going to go in there if it started activating as that rapid set product can do. Yep, so we have a couple projects here. We have three pavers with some joint space in between and this one was watered very lightly. Okay. We watered this once and misted it and walked away from it. So yep. I'm going to try to pull this frame off here and we'll take a look at what we have. Oh, so a lot of loose what we've sand. got is a nice thin crust <laughs> <laughs> and that sand underneath. So if we densely pack that sand, it could at least support the crust, but yeah. this crust is so thin because it wasn't watered properly, it's bound to fail over time. Right, and I can see what you're talking about here as, uh, I don't know if we we're able to pick that up on yep. the uh, GoPro, but you can see how if there's water pushing up, adding that hydrostatic charge, that's going to give you that worming effect. Right, and I can pull that off. You can see how thin that skin is. Yeah. That initial activation of polymeric sand is very important. Right. If you get a proper depth of that water penetration, you're going to get a nice, thick, durable, resilient crust. Yeah. If you missed it once lightly and walk away, you're going to get a very thin crust, and you're at the mercy of Mother Nature to say, you know, does that pen you know, next rainfall penetrate deeper and help you out, or does that next rainfall not do you any good? The top is just so water repellent that it repels all that water. So you really need to make sure that you activate those joints properly to get the best performance. Right. And you always talk about that, you know, usually that polymeric sand and certainly the watering aspect is often done by the lowest paid guy on the job and probably the guy that's probably the t most tired on the job. So the best way to avoid this horror story is really make sure that that person's trained properly. They understand how to water it and make sure they get the watering done right so you get that nice thick crust. Right. So I might need a little help with this one, but we're going to try Try to oh boy. get this frame off here. Oh, that's coming I there. Almost have it. All so right. this one was watered properly. Okay. 30 square feet for 30 seconds. I think I watered this for about a second. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you can see it's pretty well set up almost to the bottom of these yeah. joints here, right? So we've got Very some loose material, crust. but nice thick crust. Yep. That's going to be durable. It's going to maintain some flexibility. It'll soften up a little bit when it gets wet, harden up when it dries out. It can move a little bit with those pavers and perform its intended function. Right. And I'll try to break this apart. Wow, that is thick. So you can see the material in here, huh? Let's see, we got a better break. That one's better. 
So you can see on here, we've got about a three-quarter inch to an inch thick crust. Yeah. Hardened solid polymeric sand material. Still a little bit wet underneath. And, we and did it's this amazing, yesterday. you know, like you're saying, that's the crust. You still have loose sand underneath it, even in a properly performing sand joint. That's the whole idea of polymeric sand. Right. It's a thick, durable crust supported by densely packed material underneath. Right. We'll touch on another product. If you truly want a joint that's hard top to bottom, we do have a new product called Gator Nitro that fulfills that need. Yeah, a <laughs> little different and, and has some really great attributes, but performs differently in terms of flexibility than our, our traditional polymeric sands. Right. So a lot to do with watering. And Mike, I think this is by far the most colorful demo you've ever put together here. And this really shows, I think, the final impact of the watering. Well, I, I thought that by the time we got here, halfway through the show, you might want to snack. <laughs> yeah. Since you're being healthy these days, I got you some celery. Try, trying to be. Shave those COVID pounds off, right? All right. So this is a little bit goofy, but most of us have probably done this at some point in our lives. You put the yep. celery in food coloring, and you watch that food coloring work its way up the celery stalks, wick yeah. its way up in there. Yeah. And polymeric sand joints work the same way, right? Capillary yeah, okay. action will pull water up right through that joint. So we'll dispense with the celery for right now, All but we right. will take a look at this other demonstration here. So we talked about how stone dust can keep the area underneath your pavers wet, right? right? An improperly done concrete overlay can keep the area underneath your pavers wet. Having clay soils and not allowing for drainage can also keep all that material underneath your right, pavers yeah. wet. And if everything underneath your pavers is wet, where does that water go? Clearly, it can't drain downward, right? It's wicking right up through the celery leaves. <laughs> it's wicking its way right up. Pavers are pretty tough and dense, right? Yeah, absolutely. Some of the, w the uh, pavers that these manufacturers are making these days, they're so dense, they have virtually negligible water absorption. So the only place that water is going to go, it's certainly not going through the paver. It's going through the polymeric sand. Right. It wants to take the path of least resistance, go from that area where it's super wet underneath to right. dry out at the surface and wick its way right up through the joint. Yep. So you can see this stuff we put in here a couple days ago, and the paving stone is wet right to the line where the water was, right? Yep. That w water did not wick up into the paving stone itself. Right, right. Now we've got a piece of wood. So that wood kind of simulates the polymeric sand joint. Wicked up quite a bit, right? That water sucked its way up, and it's wicking its way through that wood piece. Yep. The polymeric sand joint that we put in there actually wicked up all the way to the top. It's a little bit hard to see, but wow, yeah. very, very red at the bottom, but wet almost all the way to the top. Yeah, you can see how that's really just pulling up. So anything that it's sitting in, in that stone dust example, that uh, overlay example, it's just going to sit and wick up that water, which is really not good for polymeric sand. Right. So polymeric sands do very well with getting wet, expanding a little bit, drying out, hardening up. Cycling can happen millions of times. Yeah. That's the way they're supposed to work. Right. But it can be a problem if they never cycle. Yep. If they always stay wet, they always stay mushy, kind of like this little sand channel example we did for you earlier. That can be a problem over time. You get right. the moss mold and mildew. You get that very thin crust, that worming effect. So things need to be able to dry out. We need to make sure that our projects can have proper surface pitch for surface water runoff, no puddling or ponding on the surface. But that subsurface environment is even more important. Right. And you always taught me that polysand needs two things. Like you are saying, we water activate it 30 for 30 if you're using G2, and it has to dry out. That gets its activation. Right. It's not a chemical reaction like gator nitro or a bag yeah. of concrete, right? If you toss a bag of concrete in a lake, it's going to harden up into a block of concrete. Right. Polymeric sands don't work that way. It's just a drying reaction to harden up. So if your joints are soft, if they're still wet, they're not going to be hard. Right. Don't expect them to be. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. So that talks about a lot of the water moist and, and moisture issues that we had. I think the other question we get quite frequently is about how it performs on weather conditions like we're experiencing here in New Jersey where it might get into the 40s during the day. Right. Today it's probably about 50 degrees, but tonight it will drop below freezing. So can you install polymeric sand if it's going to freeze overnight? Well, our threshold is down to zero degrees, but you raise a good question is what happens if it goes below freezing at night? So we've had a lot of weather lately in the Northeast, so we had a chance to put that to the test, Mike. Let's roll that video and see how it performs. <laughs> Hey, 
Hey everybody, George with Alliance here. As you know, all our poly sands can be installed all the way down to the freezing mark. But we always get the question of, what happens if I install during the day and then at night it drops below freezing? So, I figure the best way to show you, put it to the test. We're out here on the ice to show you it's freezing. We're gonna take a look at what happens with warm weather and then later at night going down below freezing. All right, we're back inside here where it's a little warmer, where you would normally be doing your polymeric sand. We got a little demo kit set up here. It's just some uh, pavers inside a metal frame on top of Gator Base, of course. And just simulating probably about a uh, half to one inch wide joint, probably a little excessive for pavers, but perhaps a natural stone joint. And we're gonna activate this here and then wait 15 minutes and show its rain safe ability. And then we're gonna take it back outside into the cold and see what happens. So let's get this activated here. So normally we'd be using our 30 for 30 watering, 30 square feet, 30 seconds. I think that should be a good watering. So looking over here at our clock, we've got 523, so we'll be back in about 15 minutes. All right, so 538, it's 15 minutes. Let's check out what we have here. So G2 is rain safe in 15 minutes. What do we mean by rain safe? Well, that means it's going to be cohesive and able to repel rainwater after 15 minutes. It doesn't mean it's completely set up, and that's a big part of our test here today. So you can see, if we come in close, this sand is really starting to get cohesive. It's a little gummy, so it's not rock solid like we would normally see it after a full activation. However, it's cohesive and rain safe, ready for uh, a rainstorm. So. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna take it back outside so to simulate if you installed this product in normal weather above freezing and then it dropped below freezing at night, we'll show you what happens in a little bit. So let's get outside and see what we can do. All right, so we're outside. It's nighttime, just like your job sites. You installed during the day when it was above freezing. Now it's dropped below freezing and we're wrapping up the job. So let's see what happens. We're gonna set those out here in the snow. It's clearly below freezing, and we're gonna come back in about 12 hours and see what happens and take a look. Hey, we're back. It's about uh, 18 hours after we first did our uh, sand activation. Remember, we started this inside where it was certainly above freezing. We came outside where it was well below freezing. It sat overnight in the snow, and let's take a look and see what we've got here. Definitely got some snow overnight, and if we get rid of some of that snow, we can see that the sand is still not set up. It is definitely still a little bit soft as expected. We're gonna take that back inside and let it get back above freezing and make sure it sets up actively and correctly. All right, Mike, you put together a lot of nice demos over the year. I figure it was my turn, and so I brought you a gift. These are the pavers that we installed Friday night. That's what we do in the polymeric sand business. We horse around on a Friday night and do these kooky tests, but these are the actual pavers, and when we brought these in, they were still mushy, probably two days after the installation because they froze. So now we're here probably another two days later after the activation, and I brought you a little present. Yeah, we kept this in our studio for a few days. It thawed out a little bit. Um, it's still, I mean, the surface is a little bit wrinkly from George pushing his big <laughs> thumb in there, but yep. it's pretty darn solid. I mean, uh, uh, let's see what we got here, right? Yeah. So we can punch through it, but man, that's some tough stuff, huh? Yeah. So that's what we're talking about, the poly sand. Once it gets wet, that activates the polymers, and then it needs to dry out. So that freezing temperature really delays the drying process. But while it's not something that we recommend by any means, it will work over time after it has a chance to properly warm up and dry out when you get that question. Right. But it's kind of like hitting the pause button yeah. on that drying reaction on the curing of the Gator Max polymeric sands. Yeah, so a question that we often get, and we had some great weather, so it was a great opportunity to kind of explain it to you, uh, but we do not recommend that. Our sands are good down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius is really the bottom floor threshold of where we want it to be used. George is just used to those metric things. He's studying for his Canadian citizenship <laughs> test. <laughs> 
So fantastic. So, hey, that was a great look at polymeric sand. We'll, we'll close with another video, but we are really excited that you participated today. We had a lot of great questions, and we'll do a lot of other great training that we have. Yeah, and hopefully you enjoyed our presentation. If you go online to alliancegator.com slash education, you can view the last five presentations that we've done and recorded, and we've got four more coming up over the next four weeks. You can also sign up for text alerts allows you to be notified of any upcoming training events. It's really great education. We try to keep things fun and only give you the important points that you need to know. Yeah, I think it's been described as kind of a bad episode of this old house. So, but hey, we'll, we'll take it. Combined with QVC, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, and then we also have some great partners of ours that are doing some uh, really fantastic training events. So, Tackle Block launched recently their hardscaper.com programming with podcasts and live events. Um, Nikolak has trailers are coming out in a social distancing world and introducing you to new products. Uh, Unilock has their boots online program with great programming to learn from and then Cambridge is pumping out events on a weekly basis or videos to help educate you so please take advantage whether it's Alliance or any of these training programs from our great partners you know it's a great opportunity now to get educated and help do better installations so Mike I think we want to wrap things up here yeah I think so I mean just to summarize you know make sure that you account for drainage account for removing water from your projects that'll give polymeric sand the best chance for long-term success Yep. And then follow those simple instructions, right? Compact and consolidate. Make sure that your joint height is set properly and then water it correctly. Yeah, those three things lead to some really awful horror stories, but they're very easy to avoid by those simple steps. Yeah, no, you know, no rocket science here. Yeah. So thank you again for t tuning in today. We, we appreciate your business. We appreciate your willingness to invest time to learn from us. Hey, wait a second. If people do want a joint that's hard from top to bottom... What there, do we have for them? There's a really great product called Nitro, and I think that's a great way to wrap things up. Sounds good.